Okay, the purpose of this video is to demonstrate how to do a proof. What is a proof or what is a proof system? A proof system is a way of demonstrating that an argument is valid. In other words, that it really is true that if the premises of the argument is true, then the conclusion must be true as well. Another way of thinking about what a proof system is, is that a proof system is a list of rules that say, if you have this, then you can get that. In other words, a proof system is a list of rules, not the type of rules that tell you what you can't do, the type of rules that tell you what you can do. So essentially, a proof system says if you have these types of sentences, you can get those types of sentences. And by having that list of rules, you can prove that a certain argument form or that a certain sequence, as we'll come to call it, is valid. So what are these rules of inference? In this video, we're going to have four of them. We're going to have four rules of inference in our proof system. Number one, it's called modus ponens. And modus ponens says, if you have a conditional and the antecedent of that conditional, you may infer the consequent of that conditional. And here's what that looks like with three different examples. So you see over here, uh, example number one, you have if P then Q, and you have P, so you're allowed to infer Q. You have a conditional, and the antecedent of that conditional, so you infer the consequent of that conditional. In this second example, you have a conditional again. If A or B, then C or D, and on line two, or down below, you have A or B, so you're allowed, you are allowed to infer C or D. And then over here, you have X, and then you have if X, then Y, so you're allowed to infer Y. The point here being with this example, the conditional doesn't have to come first. If you have the antecedent of a conditional, and then later you have the conditional, you're still allowed to infer the consequent of that conditional. So hopefully, uh, with our description here and these three examples, you can see what all of them, with what all of the examples have in common. You have a conditional and the antecedent, and so you infer the consequent. Our second rule of inference out of four is modus tollens, which says if you have a conditional and the negation of the consequent of that conditional, you may infer the negation of the antecedent of that conditional. And here are some examples. And if you have if P then Q, and you know that not Q, you're allowed to infer that not P. If you have A or B, then C or D, and you know it's not the case that C or D, you're allowed to infer that it's not the case at A or B. Right? And so the idea here is, right, if you know that uh, if Josh is from Chicago, then he's from Illinois, and then you find out, well, he's not from Illinois, of course, you can infer that he's not from Chicago. That's the basic idea. And just like with modus ponens, it doesn't matter what order these sentences come in. If you have the negation of Y, and you have if X then Y, you know that uh, it not x, you know, negation x. A third, this one's fairly straightforward, the rule of simplification. If you have a conjunction, you may infer either conjunct. It's, again, pretty straightforward. If you know that p and q, you're allowed to infer p. You're also allowed to infer q. You don't have to infer both of them, but you can. If you know that a or b and c or d, you're allowed to infer a or b. You don't have to infer C or D in addition to that. And then in our last example here, if you have X and Y, it doesn't matter what order you infer them in. Again, if you have a conjunction, you can infer either conjunct. You can infer both of them. You can infer one of them. Uh, it doesn't matter. Fourth, and our final rule for this video, the rule of conjunction. If you have any two sentences, you may infer a conjunction in which they are the conjuncts. So if you have P and you have Q, you're allowed to infer P and Q. If you have A or B, if you have C or D, you're allowed to infer a conjunction of those two things. And same thing here with our last example. Uh, it doesn't matter what order they come in, you can, still inf you can still infer a conjunction of them in whatever order you'd like. So that is the rule of conjunction. And here are our four rules shown together, modus ponens, modus tollens, simplification and conjunction. It would probably benefit you to commit these to memory if you can, uh, memorize them. How do you do a proof? 
we're going to have to add one symbol here. If you might see it here, the uh, the little turnstile, what we're going to call our inference bar. And here's what that means, essentially. If you see a sequence like this with our little turnstile inference bar, what that means is if you are given these sentences, we got three of them to the left here, show me that you can get or prove this sentence over here. This is kind of an argument. The argument says if if you have P, if you have Q, and if you have P and Q, then R, show me that R is also true. If you have everything on the left, show me that you can use the rules to quote unquote get or infer the sentence on the right of the little turnstile. And here's what a completed proof looks like. That's a completed proof. This proof is complete from the sequence. Uh, here to the right, you might see, okay, what is all this uh, mumbo jumbo? This is what we might call our justification column. Whenever you have a line in a proof, you have to justify why that line goes there. So you see that lines one, two, and three are justified by just this letter A. That stands for assumption. You're given P and Q and if P and Q then R in your assumptions. Those are to the left of your inference bar. You're given those. And so you're justified in putting them there because they are assumptions that you were given. So you choose A for assumptions to mark that you were given those sentences. Okay, and then line four is justified by the rule of conjunction from lines one and two. On one, you have, a con you have P. On two, you have Q, and you're allowed to infer a conjunction of them. And then on line five, you infer R because of modus ponens. Line three and four, you have a conditional, and the antecedent of that conditional, so you infer the consequence. And that's where we were supposed to uh, end up, so we're done. This is a completed proof. Okay, but let's slow down and, and maybe go step by step. When you start a proof, you should ask yourself these three questions. What types of sentences do I have? Question two, do I see my conclusion or anything like it in my assumptions? And then the third question, given my answers to the first two, what rules am I likely to use? So these are three good questions to begin a proof with, if, especially if you're not quite sure how to get started. What types of sentences do I have? Do I see my conclusion or anything like it in my assumptions? And given my answers to one and two, what rules am I likely to use? So here's a proof, or here's a sequence that, you ha that you'll be asked to prove, maybe. Uh, you're given P and Q, and you're given if P, then R. And you're supposed to end up with R. So before you do anything, you probably want to list out your assumptions. You're given P and Q, you're given if P, then R, and you're supposed to end up with R. And so the first thing that you want to do is you want to ask yourself that first question, what types of sentences do I have? Well, you have a conjunction on line one, and you have a conditional on line two, so that answers that question. Question number two, do you see your conclusion or anything like it in your assumptions? You do. You're trying to end up with R, and you see that R is on line two here as a consequent of a conditional. Now, the answers that we just gave to those two questions, question number one, we have a conjunction and we have a conditional. And question number two, we're trying to end up with R and we see that R is the consequent of a conditional. Those should sort of tell us what we're likely to use in our proof. We have a conjunction and we have a conditional. One thing that we can point out here to start is that we're probably not going to use the rule of modus tollens. Remember the rule of modus tollens says if you have a conditional and the negation of the consequent, you're allowed to infer the negation of the antecedent. We don't have any negations, so we're probably not going to use modus tollens because we don't have what it takes to get it. So that's something to keep in mind. We're not going to probably not going to use modus tollens. Another thing to keep in mind is we said we're going to end up with R, and R is the consequent of a conditional. And we have a rule where you end up with a consequent of a conditional, modus ponens, or MP for short. In order to use modus ponens, we have to have a conditional, which we have. We have if P, then R. We only have to get P. We only have to get the antecedent of that conditional, and we can use 
modus ponens to get R. How do we get P? Well, if you look up here, we have P and Q. How can we get P? We can get P because of the rule of simplification. If you have a conjunction, you're allowed to infer either conjunct. That's what the rule of simplification says, or from line one. And now we have now we can infer R because of modus ponens from lines two and three. But that's where we were supposed to get, so we're done. Here's another example. Let's list out our assumptions, right? We have a conditional, and we have a negation, right? That's our, answers, that's our answer to the first question. What types of sentences do we have? Do we see our conclusion or anything like it in our assumptions? Well, we're trying to end up with not P and not Q. We have not Q. We only need to get not P. And if we could get not P, then we can infer not P and not Q because of the rule of conjunction. And so now we're, we should try to get not P. How can we get not P? What rules are we likely to use given where we're trying to go? What rules are we likely to use given the answers to questions one and two? Well, we can get not P by the rule of modus tollens, one and two. On one, we have a conditional. On two, we have the negation of the consequent. So on line three, we're allowed to infer the negation of the antecedent. But now we can just sort of, quote unquote, put those two things together. And now we have not P and not Q. That's justified by the rule of conjunction, lines two, and three. Here's another example of what we've already have our assumptions laid out for us. We have if R then P, we have not P, we have if not R then Q. All right, so we have a conditional, a negation, and another conditional. Do we see our conclusion or anything like it in our assumptions? Again, we do. It's the consequent of a conditional we have a rule that allows us to infer the consequent of a conditional, modus ponens, so long as we have the antecedent. So we're trying to get not R. How do we get not R? Well, we have if R then P, and we also have not P, so we're allowed to infer not R by the rule of modus tollens, 1 and 2. Right. On 1, we have a conditional. On two, we have the negation of the consequent. So on line four, we're allowed to infer the negation of the antecedent, which, we, which is not R. And now on line five, we can get Q because of modus ponens three and four. On three, we have a conditional. On four, we have the antecedent. And so we're allowed to infer the consequent. Now it might be confusing because usually, or in a lot of examples with modus ponens, we don't have any negations. The antecedent in three is not R. And so if we have not R again, yes, it is a negation, but that's right what the antecedent is. And so it's just a normal example using modus ponens. It's just slightly more complicated. Let's look at another example. Again, we have our assumptions laid out. We have if P, then if R, then Q. And we have not Q and P. And ultimately, we want to end up with not R. So if you want to, you can pause the video and ask yourself those three questions. What sort of sentences do I have in my assumptions? Do I see my conclusion or anything like it in my assumptions? And then given my answers to one and two, what rules am I likely to use? Okay, uh, well, one, here's one strategy to keep in mind. If you have a conjunction like this, one thing you can always do is simplify it. So if you have not Q and P, just go, you know, even if it ends up being a dead end, go ahead and put them on their own line. So we have three simplification from two. We have four simplification from two. 
And now we just have more sentences to play with. Again, maybe those will be a dead end, but if they likely will get us somewhere. But now look at what we can do with one and four. On one, we have a conditional. On four, we have the antecedent, so we're allowed to infer the consequent. The consequent of one is if r then q, and so we put that on line five, modus ponens one and four. But now if you look at three and five, we can get not r because of modus tollens from three and five. And that's where we're trying to go. That's where we were trying to get to, and so we're done. Here's another example. I have all of our assumptions laid out here. And we're trying to end up with S and R. So here's another sort of a strategy type of thing. If you're trying to end up with a conjunction, one strategy that might end up working is if you can get S on its own line and you can get R on its own line, then you can just quote unquote put them together with the rule of conjunction. But if you notice, we already have R on its own line. So if we can only just get S, then we can again put them together and we'll be done. How can we get S? Well, we see that S is here. It is a part of a conjunction. S is part of a conjunction that is the consequent of a conditional. Let's see if we can get that consequent of that conditional on its own line. If we can only get the antecedent, let's see how that works. We have a conjunction of two and three. We just put them together. Uh, R and P. But now if we have one and four, we have a conditional and the antecedent of that conditional. So we can infer the consequent of that conditional because of modus ponens one and four. And then we can simplify out S from five. But then it must be the case that S and R by the rule of conjunction two and six and we're done. Yet another example, ask yourself those three questions. Here's some practice for you to do, if you'd like. Uh, you can pause the video for a second and try out this proof and then unpause it and you will see the completed proof. Here's one more example like that. You can pause the video if you would like and see the completed proof after you've tried it yourself. And just one more example like that. Try it yourself and see what you come up with. And here's the completed proof. Okay, that is essentially the end of the video. Um, if you don't find this intuitively obvious, right away that's perfectly fine you're not alone if this isn't immediately obvious to you a lot of people find themselves in that uh predicament you might have to watch the video again you might have to memorize the rules a little bit more carefully but keep with it try and try and practice and and eventually you'll pick it up it, again it's not the type of thing that most people can just do immediately so uh, stick with it and do what you can